Okay, now we're good. Um, <laughs> so, so the chaos here is that we, <laughs> I, I have a lot to talk about. We have a lot going on here um, because uh, whether it's a good idea or not, we I decided to move on to the Avicenna and we want to talk about those issues. But I had such, um, <laughs> I'm still really thinking about the some of the issues that came up last time in particular um and and uh, yeah the notion of a person and and then i don't think we talked about the second thing that i want to just insert here for a minute which is having to do with emotion um and so those the questions about the nature of the person and and uh, the the uh, the issues that that raised are percolating through me um and so i want to i before we move on i i just want to say a few things <laughs> about the notion of a person and and this is something we will no doubt come back to again um so i did i i'm yeah so i did a little quick research and i was going to give you more things to read but i restrained myself um and <laughs> and it's all floating around in my head and there is yeah there <laughs> yeah, i'm sorry but we'll 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 be okay um I thought about, I've been thinking about this for ever since last week, and and then all day today. And I'm really excited about this, but I but I have so much that I don't know how to organize it. And um, so let's start um, a couple of places. It would I think be useful to um, get in our conversation or my monologue um, some a, a little bit of fleshing out of the idea of a person because what one of the things that we were talking about last time i hope <laughs> um was the 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 zoroastrian angelology that Corbin is so enthusiastic about. And one of the really interesting um uh one of the really interesting corollaries of of talking about personhood in that cosmological setting is that it turns out to be intimately connected with the nature of the material world. And I think that became a little clearer last time. Um, I mean, okay, so first of all, one of the, maybe the first thing that comes up in his text is that that's really striking is the idea that time itself manifests as a person but then i i don't exactly remember but we started talking about an animated and animist cosmology 
because if time is a person, then gosh, certainly animals are. And um, or at least it seems plausible. And, and in fact, it is true that in the, in the cosmology that he's talking about, the, the world itself has, as I was trying to articulate, aspects of personhood. And then, of course, what happened is we realized that we don't have any way to think about that without some more um, uh, terminology. And, and, and so I, I went to one of the places that one might go to, which is to the, to the work of the philosopher Charles Taylor. I mean, in actual, in all honesty, the first thing I did was Wikipedia, <laughs> you know? I mean, that, that's pretty shameless of me, but it can be kind of helpful because it jogs your memory and most of the stuff on Wikipedia is at least, you know, tolerably uh, articulate. Uh, and sometimes really quite wonderful. And so I look, looked quickly through that and I realized a number of things. And I thought, oh, Charles Taylor, Taylor would be a good place to go. And, and the reason for that, I think he's still alive. He's a Canadian, I think, um, and he's a philosopher. And, and he's been very influential over the decades that he has been in public life. And, and he's also um, very religious, but um, in a in a way that doesn't um, that overlaps, uh, you know, with his philosophical approach, but he is not a theologian. You know, he's an honest to God philosopher, and so he realizes that these things are in some sense separate. But one of the things that he's super interested in about is is the, is what it means to be in a secular world, and and one of his major works is called A Secular Age, I think, um, and it's a massive tome. But as a person with, with a religious sensibility and as a philosopher, he's super interested in how we lost contact with what now we call religion. So he's thought deeply about all this stuff. Um, and, and so, and, and clearly, the, the, the concept of the person in Western history is profoundly tied up over historical time with uh, primarily Christianity. And there's a long history, which is very interesting in our context of trying to resuscitate something like an animated universe. There's a long history of, of the, and, and there's a great literature on this long history beginning whenever you want to begin it but i suppose we could say with the beginnings of christianity and the and the dominance of monotheism in western culture um there's a long history tracking the disappearance of the paganism of the pre-christians and that that is to say the 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 long history of the suppression of the animate from the the world and and its its progressive um, uh, entrapment inside the human soul, and then when soul became a word that philosophers and scientists didn't want to use because it was religious, then what happens to all that animism that got? slowly bleed, bled out of the world and put inside the individual's soul. And then once you start doing neurophysiology, just, there is no soul and you've lost everything. <laughs> okay, so that's the long history that, that uh, Taylor and many, many, many others have talked about. And so we're going in the opposite direction. And so it's, it's, so, so that makes it super complicated. So anyway, I went to Charles Taylor, um, and in an early book, he wrote um, a chapter called The Concept of a Person. And with that as a huge long introduction, I really don't want to say too much, but I want to start getting some of the terms in our conversation here. Um, and, and this is one of his early works. And, and he says, well, what do we mean by a person? Well, 
A person is a being with a certain moral status. And footnote in the middle of my sentence, I'm just trying to make a little bit conscious some of the things that most of us here are, are unconsciously associating with the idea of person, okay? And, and certainly including me. So there's a certain moral status, you know, there's some ethical stuff, there's good and bad and right and wrong involved. Um, or, and, and the political comes in, if you're a person, you have, you might have rights, you know? Okay, so that has something to do with being a person. But then he says, underneath those sort of social things, um, there's the fundamental condition that a person is a being who has a sense of self, and in one sense, that doesn't help very much, you know, because what does that mean? Well, a certain degree of um, unity, you know, I am me, and I am me through time, and I have memory, and here he here I, I'll I'll just quote from him: a person is a being who has a sense of self, has a notion of the future and the past. And and if you you know think about each of these things, boy, it would be hard. Yeah, okay, it would be hard without those things to be to yeah to be a person. You have, you can hold values, that's the moral status thing. You can make choices, you know, all right. Um, and in short, he says, you can adopt life plans. Or, okay. Um, and then he says a person, and a, you know, and he's not saying these things are true. He's just saying these are ideas that are typically correlated in Western philosophy with the idea of personhood. A person must be a being with his own point of view on things. And it's that idea of the point of view, which is maybe uh, one of the more interesting ideas here. A person is a being um, with a, with a, with choices and a point of view, uh, and and that so there's a certain sense of individuality. I mean, there there is no plural person. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, there is. <laughs> and and so, so one of the things to be said here is that uh, walking on this ground is um, really, <laughs> really difficult. I got halfway through this chapter of, of Taylor and I thought, whoa, 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 I'm going to have to work through this really slowly because every f step he takes, it's like, oh man, yeah, I guess. <laughs> it's really kind of tricky. Um, but then he says, a person is a being who can be addressed and can reply. Let us call a being of this kind a respondent. Okay, uh, and, and I, I think I mean, he's, this is a really pretty good uh, chapter, but a person is, is a being who can reply and who can be a respondent. And, and, During the period in Western thought, uh, when um, the mechanical paradigms were becoming dominant, um, people like Descartes could say, oh, well, animals don't have souls, um, and they're not really persons, and they're really just machines, you know. Um, and, and therefore, vivisection, for example, is perfectly legit because any, they don't really, they don't really feel pain, you know. <laughs> and most people, I think probably everybody here, uh, no longer thinks of animals that way. We've, we've already cured ourselves of the machine vision of, you know, there's not too many people that torture animals, and the ones that do 
we look on as deeply disturbed. So even if we're not going to give full personhood, whatever we might mean by that, to our pets, we certainly think of them as respondents who can answer when they are addressed and who will tell us things. And I've been, I've been, I've been on Twitter a lot lately. And of course, if you're there long enough, you eventually hit dog and cat Twitter and animal Twitter. And if nothing will can, if you have not yet been convinced that animals are persons, just go on Twitter for a while and look at the things that get posted. And it will absolutely convince you that dogs and cats are totally persons. <laughs> they are absolutely respondents who act and have choices. And maybe their sense of futurity isn't as developed as ours, but by God, they have the whole suite of you know, maybe, yeah, I mean, I think so. Anyway, so, so those of us who are perfectly comfortable with personifying pets, we're in a way better position to head back towards the Zoroastrians than Descartes was, okay? So we're already halfway there. And, and then, then the next step is sort of to do the same thing for plants <laughs> um, and and then rocks. I mean, obviously, I skipped most of the biological kingdom, but you see where we're sort of heading. Um, so let's let's just hold there with the Charles Taylor stuff because he does a very nice historical review of bringing animals into the fold and and then making moral distinctions and other things. Um, um, and and one of the uh, suggestive things that he says, and, and I think this is a case where language helps us out, he says, an agent is saying that persons are agents. That is, they can they can initiate actions on their own. Right. So persons are also agents, and he says agents can be respondents because things matter to them, and that's one of his categories of personhood. That that things matter to you. And philosophically, that might be kind of vague, and yet it seems super important. Things matter to you. You know, you're not just a rock rolling down a hill. You know, you're not, you're not just a mechanism for which nothing can truly matter. All right, so that's, that's part of the, the aura of personhood. Things matter to them. And, and 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 you can begin with some of these categories, perhaps, to, to transfer them to other kingdoms besides the animal. Things matter to plants, you know? There, there's, oh, well, okay, you could might say to yourself, you, if you've got all these categories, all these terms that have been applied to the person uh, during the history of the West, you know, some subset of them, you might think, yeah, I could see that in a plant. All right. Um, when it comes to other kinds of um, inorganic, non-living things, that's hard. That's hard. Um, at least it is for, I think, most people, including me. But let's now make a transition to another person to read about not precisely personhood, but the idea of the animate. And that's um, Tim Ingold, who I, I recommend wholeheartedly um, on the basis of not very much reading, but if my life were infinite, I would sit down and read everything that he's written. He's an anthropologist and a very um, prolific one as a writer. He's written lots and lots of things. And so while these things were churning around in my head, I remembered him and I thought, 
I think in making this connection between, and this is the subtext of what we've just been talking about, making the connection between personhood and materiality, maybe I should go, you know, look at what Tim Ingold has said. So, so... <laughs> Uh, so, so one of the striking and, and at first blush um, impossible uh, claims that Corban is and the Zoroastrians and then the Neoplatonists after them and so on and all the way to James Hillman. One of the really difficult thing claims that they make is that this notion of personhood might well or some some part of it might well uh, uh, um, apply to inorganic nature, and I, you know part part of my problem with that is because I as I was trained as a scientist and I took physics courses and I, but and so it may not strike you in the way that it strikes me, but you know it's kind of odd to say that inorganic things have any any personhood associated. That's 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 a stretch, right? And part of my intent here in thinking about Corbin and bringing in these other people is to make that a little bit less weird. And there is a marvelous chapter in um, um, a book by Ingold, which I have meant to read for years. It's a book called Being Alive. And in chapter five, he does things that are so good <laughs> for our purposes here that I'll quote a little bit of it. And, and this is not a recent book by him, and he's been thinking about these issues for the, all his entire professional career. And this is from some years back, so I won't, you know, it was, he, may have, he may have tweaked things by now. But chapter five is Rethinking the Animate and rethinking thought. And that's what we're doing. We're rethinking the animate and we're rethinking thought. That's what Henri Corbin was doing. This is just, it's just that Corbin was just, you know, he was doing it in the context that very few other people were doing, all right? Um, so Ingold also assumes, as does Charles Taylor, that most of us are suffused with modernism and with either explicitly or implicitly um, the, the view that the natural world is the world of physics and chemistry and forces and, you know, and that if you're looking for life and animism, that's something that occurs magically somehow inside living things. That's where animism is. And so, and so insofar as you think that, then it's fine with, the, with your dog. You know, that that's, of course, yeah. And then plants, not a stretch, and paramecia, and if you happen to know a lot of biology, any organism, you say, yeah, that's life. And then, and then of course, the problem becomes, well, what actually is life? And, you know, and I went down this path for, for a couple decades, and it's a lot of fun. And you, you're reduced to saying, well, life is the self-organization of complex systems and its chemistry and all this other stuff. And which is true enough, and I love it, but it's not what Corbin's talking about. You know, he's, he's, that's not, that's not, it's not big enough, you see, because it doesn't, precisely because it doesn't apply to anything but living creatures. So, so Ingold says um, that, um, The, it's, I'm trying, I haven't, yeah, what he, <laughs> sorry, there's a, a <laughs> he's trying to, uh, so let me, let me approach it another way. Um, he's arguing against that view, um, and he's 
arguing against that reductive view that says that the animate is a feature of living beings, you know, and only living beings. And um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I just have to skip all that preparatory stuff. And he says, look, you know, I've spent my professional career studying peoples who are not the inheritors of that long Western tradition of what Carolyn Merchant many decades ago called the death of nature. He's, you know, he says, I've, I've lived with and studied people who didn't go through that. And so their idea of what constitutes the animate is really different than ours. And, and he points out the fact that, yeah, I, I really want to compress this. He says, many people in the modern Western tradition have now recognized that attempting to put animism isolated to put to put <laughs> this is really hard to articulate to isolate the animate inside living beings causes certain incoherences um so so if you're paying a lot of attention to um uh, a contemporary intellectual discourse, you'll find um, discussions of, of reanimation in this broad sense popping up all over the place because for, for lots of reasons. What I want to say is, uh, let me quote from him. Um, be because, and I, I got so excited this morning, yesterday afternoon, reading this because I thought, oh my God, this is like, this is like exactly what Corbin is saying. Um, according to the Westerners, animism is a system of beliefs that imputes life or spirit to things that are truly inert like my rock, all right? Oh, I love it when that happens. <laughs> that's particularly great. Um, to things that are truly inert. So that's, 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 oh, those silly animists. They think that plants have persons and they think that rivers speak to them and they're so silly. They don't know modern science. And I think we can all you know, whether we were on their, on their side or not, we can certainly understand that kind of degrading view of these primitive animists. And, and Ingold is drawing, it's a great book, he's drawing on lots of contemporary scholarship, which argues the opposite, but then he's bringing in these people that he's lived with, right? But this convention of animism as as a idea that that the foolish among us are imputing spirits and life to things which are truly inert um this convention is misleading because on this view of an of a of a in some sense living universe in which, for instance, the Zoroastrians were immersed, and which Henri Corbin is himself immersed, um, we are dealing not with a way of believing about the world, but with the condition of being in it. This is so perfect. <laughs> At least it struck me. He says, you know, if you go talk to these primitive animists, they're not believing things about the world. They are living in it in a certain way. We're the ones that have sophisticated beliefs about the inanimate world, which we then master and control. On the contrary, these other people 
are in a they are different. <laughs> their Corban would happily say their mode of being is different. <laughs> and they are being in this world. And then Ingold says, this could be described as a condition of being alive to the world, characterized by a heightened sensitivity and responsiveness in perception and action to an, there's a lot here, and I love every word of it, to an environment that is always in flux, never the same, from one moment to the next. So I'm going, to, I'm going to do that again, and it's not even the sentence that I had highlighted. So th this is the move that I'm trying to articulate for you in order to bring you into Corbin's world in such a way that you're there in it, <laughs> right? Okay, a this, this mode of being is a condition of being alive to the world. So, so you're in, not alive in the world, because that's what an object might be, you know, live in the world. But no, 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 you're alive to the world. So you must be involved. You're not commenting on it from somewhere up here. You're in it, right? And it is characterized by all the things that I'm hoping for myself <laughs> and maybe achieving a little bit. That is a heightened receptivity and responsiveness. So the dialogue, you know, that is Corbett, it's all dialogue, you know, because if, 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 if the beings you're immersed with are respondents, then you got to talk to them. And I don't mean talk literally, but you have to engage them. Otherwise, you're dead, you know. And in fact, you know, that's what Carolyn Merchant meant. It was a great book, decades old, uh, the, the, the Death of Nature, in which she gives a very quick and, and lovely overview of how the, the life got sucked out of the world by Western, uh, Western culture. So, heightened sensitivity and responsiveness in perception and action. So this is not contemplation, it's activity in the world. To an environment which is perceived as always in flux and never the same from one moment to the next. And here I, you know, I engage my my ignorant imaginative capacities and I think of being alive in the woods it, to such an extent that you wake up every morning and you realize ah, oh, things are different today the animals have moved the leaves have changed you know in order not to wake up in other words in order not to wake up in the same landscape every single day you need to be attentive and to participate in it. And that's easier to perceive in the natural world than it is, say, on Fifth Avenue, although it's perceptible there. Because when humans build things, they often, we often, build them so they don't change very much. <laughs> because things are easier that way and you don't have to worry about where fifth avenue is and how you get there from the subway because things are always the same whereas if you're wandering in the woods you might notice that the path has changed because you see what I, you see the point i'm making so so in order to reanimate the world you've got to begin to engage with it on an active level and notice the things that change so, and then here's the, here's the great thing. Animacy, and that's what he calls it, animacy is not a property of persons imaginatively projected onto the things with which they perceive themselves to be surrounded. That's the old view. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he's so silly. He projects the form of God onto, you know, if you're just being disparaging about religion. Oh, yeah, God is just a projection. You know, you say, no, no, no. And, and, and you see, that's actually uh, bringing God into it in that way, the God of monotheism, 
itself screws this whole thing up. <laughs> and that's part of that long history where the animate got sucked into a monolith, which then is elsewhere. That's the history of the West in 10 seconds. And, and, and one of the problems with monotheism, and it's one of the problems that Corbin is absolutely addressing by being extremely enthusiastic about Zoroastrian angelology, because it's seriously plural, and it's seriously imminent, and seriously material. Remember the Minoch and the Getic, and the Getic is suffused with light. <laughs> You know, and it's right here. And this is obviously a different discourse with different terminology, but the movement is the same. Take the important things out of heaven and put them here. Or explicitly in the case of Ingold, take the important things out of the isolated human person and put them back in the world where you got them, for heaven's sakes. Okay, so... Animacy is not a property of persons imaginatively projected onto the things which they perceive themselves to be surrounded, the things which are essentially inanimate because, of course, only fools think that they're persons. Rather, it is the, this animacy is the dynamic, transformative potential of the entire field of relations within which beings of all kinds, more or less person-like or thing-like, depending, continually and reciprocally bring one another into existence. So this is just, you know, it's, 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 perfect. It's, it's a rephrasing of Corban. It's a rephrasing of Hillman. It's a rephrasing of me. It's a rephrasing of everyone who's in the contemporary world trying to make this move. Okay. And Ingold is beautiful. And, and of course, he's very exciting to me because he really has data to back it up. That is, he can draw on his experiences with people who are still living in that way, you know. And so that, you know, gives him some credibility as far as I'm concerned. Um, and notice, you know, the, the one of the points that he makes in here is that for many peoples, um, non-Western peoples, um, the the degree of animacy or personhood of, of, uh, of, of elements of their environment are constantly shifting, you know, so that one day the river might talk to you, the next day it might not, it might just be a damn river, you know, and that therefore this idea of the stable individuated person, which I at least sort of naturally assume comes with this territory of personification, is bullshit. It's a hangover from that bad <laughs> reductionism that we've all been raised to accept. So it's very exciting. So then he says, well, let me read that sentence again, because it's so full of, of the points that I want to make that I think are essential to understanding what Corbin is trying to get at for us in a very different context with his Neoplatonists and his Zoroastrians. You know, so, so uh, I mean, Corban, as a his, historian of religions, would have been an anthropologist, or let, let's say, if, the, if there were still communities of Zoroastrians of the old sort, that is, the ancient ones, um, you would go do the anthropology of Zoroastrian angelology, but because he's a historian and not an anthropologist, he talks about the ancient Zoroastrians. But it's the same idea. So the animate, and this I think this applies directly to the notion of the Minoch and the Getic and all that. And yeah, of course there are differences because Corban's light thing is different, but it's part of the deal. So animacy is the dynamic transformative potential of the entire field of relations. So, I mean, rocks, trees, soil, air, clouds, insects, worms, people, 
pets, <laughs> the everything, a dynamic field of relationality um, within which all these kinds of beings, which are more or less person-like depending upon the day or whatever, or their, <laughs> or their current state, um, are continually and reciprocally bringing one another into existence. So that is much more the Corbinian vision of reality than anything you're going to find uh, in the West after, oh, I don't know, the year of 1200 or something, you know, um, it got sucked out. And, and one of the arguments is that one of the culprits there is, is a misreading of monotheism. That's, that's Corbin's argument. It's a mis misreading of monotheism. If they, if they hadn't done it wrong, and he blames the, the doctrine of the incarnation, but that is another long story which we may get to. Um, so there is, might be all sorts of reasons, but this is the thing that he's trying to get us back to. The animacy of the life world is not the result of an infusion of spirit downward into substance or of agency that is generative action into the inert material but is rather ontologically prior to their differentiation and that's pure Corbin. the animacy in question is not the result of spirit being infused into matter or of activity being uh, uh, zapped into inert life, animacy is ontologically prior to those distinctions. Okay? I mean, that, that's, a, that's an encapsulated form of what we're trying to do. We're trying to see our presuppositions and recognize that no, 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 there, there's something which is ontologically prior, which underlies and makes possible, perhaps, these abstractions. And in defense of modernity, which I occasionally feel moved to do, um, there are good reasons, um, or mm, there are reasons, sometimes good perhaps, um, to make these abstractions, you know? I mean, I'm perfectly happy <laughs> with much technology, which is based largely on the abstract and instrumental um, rationality required to, to move these parts around in three-dimensional space to make things. I'm okay with that. But, you, but the argument here is that ontologically prior to that, there's this matrix of reality, which is where the primary animacy resides. Okay, and so many of these people who are my heroes and heroines, um, are, their whole attempt is to see this and not necessarily, and here's where, you know, one might be, one, one hears from time to time the critique that, well, you know, you can't go back to the past, it's lost forever. And yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, we've all used, you know, smartphones and all this other stuff. And, and, and in a very real sense, we cannot recapture the pristine experience of the Zoroastrians or the Yanomami or whoever your favorite ancient and indigenous peoples might be. But that doesn't mean we can't have our own <laughs> new kind of attentiveness and responsiveness to the fundamental animacy of the world. The cultures will be different. <laughs> and so you're not going back in some sense. You're trying to recover things that would allow you to live in the present. I mean, and, and, and that also, I should say, is, is one of 
one of the great virtues of Cor one of Corbin's most fundamental intuitions about religion in particular, which is, and this, 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 this is part of the hermeneutic discussion that maybe I'll get to, which I really want to get to today, um, because the, um, uh, um, because here's a way to read what Corbin means by hermeneutics. <laughs> and for the uninitiated, it's just a fancy word that I love so much I can't give it up for um, interpretation. And historically, in the Western tradition, it was applied to the interpretation of Holy Scripture, that is, the Bible. Um, and both Heidegger and Corbin broaden its scope. Um, and, and so does the Quran, by the way, uh, because it's quite clear, and I don't have a quote in front of me, but the Quran says, you know, God wrote the book, but he also wrote the world. So you can read both of them. <laughs> and it's that very broad sense of hermeneutics, and that's why I don't use the word interpretation, because um, I, I want hermeneutics to have that kind of meaning. And then it also, the word it also has the virtue of having Hermes, messenger of the gods, buried in it, um, because Hermes was the, was the intermediary between the divine and the human, right? And so that, for Corbin, is very much what hermeneutics is about. It's, it's mediating this divinity, whether the, the divinity is imminent or transcendent, you need to interpret, and Corbin recognizes, as did the ancient Zoroastrians and the modern indigenous peoples who have not been, you know, screwed up by the West, that the dynamic, that the world is always moving and changing, and so your interpretations must always move and change. And so I'll go back to this sentence. This animacy could be described as a condition of, no, I'm going to do it, I'm going to just be, this hermeneutics could be described as a condition, this is, this is actually perfect, hermeneutics for Corbin could be described as a condition of being alive to the world, which is characterized by a heightened sensitivity and responsiveness in perception and action to a world which is, or a text, which is always in flex, flux, never the same from one moment to the next. Corbin says, I call you to a, a, a perpetual hermeneutic. In, and in Corbin's case, he's, he's, it's a play on the Marxist revolutionaries who said, we call for permanent revolution. And Corbin says, I call for a permanent hermeneutic. And why? Because a world which doesn't change that would be the only world that would have a stable, permanent hermeneutic. And that, in Corbin's reading, and in the reading of Tim Ingold, that world would be, in fact, dead. That's, and that is the problem with any fundamentalism. It just kills things which should be and are naturally alive. And so you have the, the hermeneutic task is to be perpetually sensitive and responsive to all the persons in your world. Uh, yeah, so yeah, so that's perfect. That's 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 absolutely perfect. So and 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 as uh, as Ingold is is arguing against a view of reality which is uh, mechanical and depersonalized, so is Corbin, and he says they both would then say the animacy of the world is not the result, oh, this is perfect, of our reading 
into the world, the things we want to find there, um, the animacy is ontologically prior to our reading, to our interpreting, and it's why the interpreting is per perennially necessary. Um, and it made me so happy this morning that Ingold uses the metaphor of turning inside out, because of course he does. He doesn't use exactly that phrase, but he calls it the logic of inversion. So the, the, the logic of inversion would have it that the world is dead and we project our ideas into it. The logic of inversion is deeply sedimented within the canons of Western thought. I think that's true. And I think that many, many, many people in the contemporary world have about had enough of it. And there's a lot of people who are doing, trying to undo, that is, to turn themselves inside out, in Corbin's kind of phrase, or actually, is it David Abrams' phrase? It's both, yeah. Um, and then he says, my purpose in this chapter is to put the logic of inversion into reverse. Life having been, as it were, installed inside things, like the dog or the plant, or the person, human, or the paramecium. I want to restore these things to life by returning to the currents of their formation. Oh, and and we, we don't have time. It would be, have to be an entire course on Ingold because then he, then he gets very enthusiastic about re analyzing the currents of their formation in a, in a way that kind of mirrors Whitehead's process and reality, which is also pertinent here. I aim to recover the original openness to the world in which the people whom we call animists find the meaning of life. I, would, I aim to recover that original openness to the world in which those poor, benighted, ignorant people find the meaning of life. Because we've lost it. It's in heaven or somewhere, I don't know. <laughs> You see, this is so imminent. It's here. And in spite of Corbin's, or, or better, because of Corbin's love for the hierarchies of angelologies, he has to say that that is here. It's imminent. Otherwise, he's going to be making the same cut that gave rise to Western instrumental rationalism. The world is full of objects that we push around with our fingers. Okay. So so th it's this is this is nice because I was in I was inarticulately trying to get this across the other day that something really fundamental has to happen in our understanding of ourselves and the world in order to read do this, you know, so in, in, in order to, in order to, oh, let ourselves fall back down into the world where the other peoples find their meaning. Ah, uh, oh, oh, and I can't resist, and then I must move on. Be because you see, once you find someone who's on to this, little echoes of other parts of Corban or Hillman or whatever keep popping up. And, and one of the one of the things, if, if those of you who know Corban well and have listened to me rant for a while, that that um, the one of the one of the categories that he borrows from his colleague Etienne Souriau is that Corban borrows the category of the virtual. 
And so you have you have the real and the virtual and imagination is often in con conceived and to be in contact with the virtual and that there's lots of activity here ontologically and imminently uh, between the actual and the virtual and, and all, all that. Um, and and in exactly the same context, Ingold says life is to be understood. Oh, I, no, I should put this in the way he does because he's got he's got he's got an anchor. He says one man from among the Weminji Cree native hunters of northern Canada offered the following meaning. Uh, to the ethnographer Colin Scott, meaning of life. He says, this man, one of the hunters of northern Canada, said, life is simply continuous birth. Whoa. So in our little context of Corban and the Zoroastrians, it's like, oh, oh, well, that would fit sort of neatly with the whole, the, the whole angel out of head thing, you know? Life is continuous birth. And, and, and uh, uh, Ingold says with an exclamation point, I want to nail that to my door. It goes to the heart of the matter. And then he says, to elaborate, life in the animic ontology is not an emanation but a generation of being in a world that is not preordained, but is incipient, forever on the verge of the actual. And for me, that's like, uh, uh, that's another way of articulating the sense Corbin wants to convey to us by talking about the angel out ahead. The contexts are very different and the associations are very different, but it's the same or very similar movement of the soul, I suppose you might say. Um, and so, you know, so there. <laughs> so we have we have Charles Taylor giving us a little bit of help with what with the sort of terms that one might use for a person as a moral agent and a respondent a respondent i mean that's central to corbin's ever to everything in corbin okay a respondent is 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 an entity that can respond and you can have a dialogue I mean, and and then you see, you know, we broaden that out so that it has a more than human meaning, and that's a phrase that Ingold uses throughout here. The idea is to 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 get outside of the sense that we have of what my historian called the intensive self into the extensive self, one which is in some sense, some real lived immediate sense, uh, continuous with the world. So, so there, so, th so there's all that. <laughs> all right. So I, I think, I hope that gets us it's, a, it's another way besides just reading Henri Corbin over and over and over again to sort of move us with different words into the kind of cosmology that he's trying to, to, to reanimate. Um, ah, so there's point one, <laughs> all right. Mm, with some with some with some references to the hermeneutics to come here. Uh, what have we got? Okay, it only took me an hour. The second point, and let's see, I you know see if I can do this without taking an hour because it's I think super important. Um, how did I get here? Uh, well, I came here for other, I, I got to this place for other reasons, and maybe we even talked about it last time. Uh, I know I talked about it in the other class last week. 
in the following context, and so maybe it was you guys, we've got, we've got the rational intellect, the abstract rational intellect, which is itself an abstraction and not, not real, <laughs> um, but we think it's real. So you've got the rational abstract intellect, and then you've got inner matter down here somewhere. Um, and then you have what I was trying to articulate last time in the other class was what Hillman and Corbin call the thought of the heart. And during that discussion, I suddenly began to realize, oh, oh my God, I'm, 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 I'm bad at that because this is one of the places where emotions live. And, you know, as a poster child, whoops, no, who is that? My wife will get it. As a poster child for the um, uh, abstracted male with, you know, an attempt to uh, live in his head and, and, and abandon his body, my life is, my, my later life has been a long history of, of trying to access the feeling function in Jungian terminology. So emotions, I'm not so good at emotions. So, while we're thinking about the categories of personhood, um, one of the categories which is crucial is the, is the category of emotionality or feeling, and it's important, but we won't do it here, uh, that Jung, for instance, distinguishes between emotions and feelings, and feelings are part of the rational faculty that differentiates and emotions, those are mm, those are influxes. Those are like, what are those? And and it occurred. How much of this do I need? It occurred to me last week in a moment of self-revelation that oh my God, most of human life is a question of trying to figure out how to handle your emotions. And I'm not very good at it. Um, but and then I thought, well. But wait, that's really important. And, <laughs> and, and all, all hell broke loose. And just this morning, I thought, oh my God, James Hillman's very first book, written in 1962, was simply called Emotion. And it's a big book. It's like 400 pages long. And I thought, you know, I've never read that. And so I sat down, I started looking at the preface. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, so in the missing link for me, and, and I would expect this is less true of many of you, but the, the missing link for me in trying to come to understand Corbin and more recently here, Charles Taylor and Tim Ingold and Corbin in his attempt to, to link the category of personhood to the immediate world full of persons and partial persons, the missing link that's necessary to really bring that all alive and imminent is emotion, which uh, as a white Western male with many emotional d d d d d uh, problems, I've been running away from all my life, you know, because it's true of a lot of people, right? Because the emotions are hard and difficult and thinking usually doesn't hurt that much. <laughs> You know, and it gets you out of that. Well, what does it get you out of? It gets you out of the mud. My my intuition here is that if we're if if the problem is to get the abstract intellect to stop intellecting abstractly and to start participating in the thought of the heart then the intellect, need, the, 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 the cognitive capacities need to be linked very closely to feeling 
and therefore to the emotions that feeling is engaged in discriminating. So, I mean, I mean, I, I, I it, it's obvious to a lot of people, and it, and it has been obvious to me, but not obvious enough. So, Hillman's first book, he says, right, right in the beginning. Uh, is he, oh, oh, sorry. It's a. This is a preface written thirty years later to a new edition of his early book on emotions. Um, and he says, I want, to, I want to write a new preface for this. Um, and then he and so, so I just want to reemphasize that the argument that I'm proposing here is that to become genuine animists, we have no choice whatsoever but to participate in our emotional lives in ways which are far more sensitive, sophisticated, serious um, than many of us have learned to do. You know, they teach you to think sometimes. Uh, they teach you to do things with your body. But who the they is that teaches you you and lays down the patterns which help you um, navigate your so-called emotional life, those are often your parents. And in my case, that was not a good choice, <laughs> you know? And so, and because A, it's hard, and B, neither one of them were very good at it. But maybe it's a good thing that they were both bad at it in very different ways, <laughs> you know. So, so the argument that I'm making is that that it's 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 a it's a it's it's not a um, it's not an afterthought in the same sense that animacy is ontologically prior to the distinction between thought and matter. Um, the emotions. And whatever it is they signify is on, are ontologically prior to anything, any thoughts and abstractions we may have about the world. Okay, so the degree to which we are unable to articulate emotively and understand in the in the real sense of, of, of understand from our emotions to that degree our our, our cognitions of reality will be uh, at least misleading and incomplete and Hillman knew that and he knew it all his life and I try to forget it because it's hard or because I never learned, a, you know, some like kindergarten techniques, <laughs> right? And here, this is great. The main substance of therapeutic analysis since its inception with Freud are emotions, fear, inertia, grief, depression, dread, anxiety, anger, shame, hatred, and, of course, the complexities of love, desire, lust, jealousy, need, compassion, sympathy, obsession. <laughs> you know, the, the physicist in me says, yeah, that's right, that's why I wanted to become a physicist, because who in the hell wants to deal with that shit? And the argument I'm now making to myself is, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, <laughs> that is so wrong. <laughs> and then Hillman makes the brilliant point, these states of soul, which are in the modern world, the material, material of therapy, were once the subjects of deep philosophical thought. Plato, Plutarch, the Stoics, Aquinas, Descartes, Spinoza, Hume, on and on and on, they all wrote treatises on the emotions. 
And he says, if you look to Western theology with an eye to emotion, from Jesus and Paul onward, you will find that the theologians, too, have been most concerned with what to do with, about, and against what they called the passions of the soul. We don't do that anymore because it's all chemistry. <laughs> You, you know, <laughs> so we didn't do that shit. You know, we get we take pills, and and so so the the point that's stunning to me is you don't get access to the greenery behind me without doing that work. You get access to abstractions of the greenery behind me. But I was I was interviewed, and, and this leads directly into alchemy, which is the place where I think you might find this most um, obviously in Corbin's work. I, I was being interviewed for something yesterday, a radio thing, I, some guy in Northern England, really, really nice. We had a really good time. And we were chewing over this kind of material. And at some point, he, he had an image that he articulated of a piece of iron. And for whatever reason, I was particularly receptive in an imagistic sense. And I just got stuck on that piece of iron, which for me was, was rusty. And I had an emotion, <laughs> which I actually noticed and did not suppress because it was the most interesting part of my reaction to his image of a piece of rusty iron, which I could immediately taste and see. And what was the emotion? I don't know, I'm bad at naming my emotions, and I haven't given it a whole lot of thought since then. But the point is, and I should put this phone else, we never get phone calls, I don't know what's going on, um, that it seemed to me in that moment, and since then, and reading Hillman, since having that moment yesterday, it's like, oh my God, talk about having a blind spot that makes reality, it just drains everything out of reality. I mean, just boosh, it's gone. Uh, you suppress them, you if you're me. One suppresses them, one doesn't learn to discriminate them, one doesn't want them because they're too hard to handle and they're... So it's alchemy. That's where, in for Hillman and for Corbin and for Jung, that's where emotionality and feeling intersect with materiality. I find this revelation, which to me is a revelation, to some of you it may be super obvious, <laughs> and that would be great, uh, great for you, um, but I've known this, but I never really did anything with it. You know, I've known this to be true. It's one of the, I was, I'm having one of those moments that one has in therapy when something that you've known for decades suddenly shows itself in a new light and you think, holy shit, oh my God, I didn't know that. So what I didn't know is that the discrimination that I've been calling for isn't, I mean, it isn't really material or cognitive, well, or, or intellectual, it is cognitive, it's emotional. That's the place where I need to go. My current therapist occasionally will say, well, how does that feel? And that's the place where I always come up empty. Uh, uh, bad. <laughs> And, or good. <laughs> and the argument I'm making to me and you is that that just won't cut it. If you really want to be in the world, if you want to be in the animate world, this is the first place that you have to learn your way around. Or at least it's, if not first, it's right up there. The next thing Ah, oh, shit. Well, <clears throat> the next thing that's crucial to understand, and this fits with the opening of personhood out of the trap of the individual soul 
into that wider world that we were just doing with Ingold. The, the, there's a similar move in Hellman. To be in the grips of an emotion makes us instantly, intelligibly, and commonly human. And, and here it is, beyond human too. So we just, poorly or well, took the little trip that got us out of the head of the person and into an animate cosmos where we discovered the potential for virtual and actual persons and partial persons everywhere. And so we unlocked the, 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 the prison of the isolated subject in a world of objects. And Hillman asks us to do the same thing with the world of emotions. And of course, in Hillman's universe, that leads you directly to, to the, the gods and goddesses, particularly of the Greeks and the Romans. Because um, uh, um, we, in the same sense that we don't project animacy onto the world from onto a onto an inner world from inside a living self, the emotions are in fact what connects us. The emotions are not ours. <laughs> All right. Mm. From an archetypal perspective, by which I mean the view which holds Emotions, oh, let me, let me, let me redo his sentence. Archetypally, emotions are primary and irreducible, transhuman and ubiquitous, and of major value in forcing unconsciousness on their subject. And, he says, from this perspective, emotions are the theme of earthly life. Whoa. <laughs> so the physicist in me is, oh, man, no. <laughs> no, the theme of life is to understand and to download your brain into a computer and to head off into the universe because it would be clean and neat. And then, my contention here shall be that though they be felt deeply and that we suffer emotions physically and inwardly, this fact does not make them ours. So I think if you, if you, if you think in these terms about what the inversion that Corban is trying to suggest using the Zoroastrian angelology, one of the things that one of the characteristics of that move is that it it's hard to get the right word. It it takes them out of the realm of the private into the realm of the cosmological. And that's the move that Hillman suggests must be done with emotions. Rather, I believe that emotions are there to make us theirs. They want to possess us, rule us, win us over completely to their vision. And then here comes William Blake. William Blake said, some good we may do when the man is in a passion, but no good when the passion is in the man. Hillman reads that as 
in Jungian terms, you don't have complexes, the complexes have you. And insofar as they have you and you literalize them, uh, that's very bad. What you must see, as Ingold says of animacy, is that these are you are these are visitations from the outside that are passing through you and they do not belong to you hillman says somewhere here that we're such capitalists that things have to be mine and that that focus on possessiveness and owning things makes it impossible for us to access the world Okay, <laughs> so there's that. And now, with a little bit left, let's talk a little more about uh, Tahuil and hermeneutics. And actually, ooh, ooh, jeez, what did I want to... Oh, yeah. Okay, I have a... I know what I want to do. Which again is <laughs> this I'm actually doing on purpose. Oh, there's so much in that those passages from Avicenna, and I'm going to have to at least for the moment skip over the first part of it, which is about valorizing a plurality of worlds, and we really do want to talk about that. But in the context that we've got right here sort of half alive, um, I want to talk about the Tahuil as um, spiritual transformation, but I don't want to do it in solely in Corbin's terms. Oh, dear. Um, I want to draw on the work of some poets, one in particular, um, who, <laughs> uh, who used Corbin as a source and an inspiration. And this works really well, I think, in terms of the, 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 the quote from, from Ingold. Yeah, this is good. So here again, I'll do, I'll do it again. Reading Ingold talking about animacy, and I substituted the word hermeneutics. Let's do that again. And now I'm thinking in terms of, you know, the Avicenna book. We're finally getting to the Avicenna book. So it's the page 28 stuff with Tahuil as exegesis of the soul. And the reading I want to give it is, you know, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm trying to read Corbin as a contemporary theorist I mean, in like 2022, you know, a contemporary writer whose work looks to be, to some people at any rate, way out off somewhere else. And I just want to emphasize the ways in which what he was doing are, are, are so close to what so many other people people are now doing, which is a kind of reanimation or an inversion or a turning inside out, you know. So, hermeneutics could be described as a condition of being alive in the world characterized by a heightened sensitivity and responsiveness to a world that is always in flux. What Corbin says is, the Tahuil, which he borrows from the Shiites, it's their particular kind of hermeneutics of the Quran or of the world, read as a book. The Tahuil, he says, in the end, it finally appears as the mainspring of every 
spirituality, which is, that's a, that's a broad claim. But in the context of Ingold and Hillman, it's like, right, of course it is. Okay. It finally appears as the mainspring of every spirituality insofar, insofar as spirituality and animacy are, are, are allied or linked in the measure to which it preeminently furnishes the means of going beyond all conformisms, all servitudes to the letter, all opinions ready-made. You see, so he's opposing fundamentalism and a world which is alive, and in Ingold's term, in Ingold's phraseology, a world which is dynamic, uh, uh, with transformative potential of the entire field of relations in which all beings participate, and it is always in flux. That captures part, an important part, of what Corban means here. And, and I've got to be a little bit careful not to, no, I will, we'll do what I was going to do anyway. There are, I'm, I'm hesitating because there are obviously some big differences between Tim Ingold and Henri Corban. And I, I don't want to deny that those are important. And yet, I think something like what Ingold is doing is, in, is, 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 is a necessary corollary to understanding what Corbin is doing. And they're going there. <laughs> Sorry. And um, I'm, I'm going to jump. I'm going to make a jump that I don't usually make. And I was going to show you pictures, but I'm not um, because they're not that important. And my, my, my AirPods just died completely. So if anyone wants to say anything and wants me to hear it, wave your hand and I'll put something else up in my ears. Or wait, no, no, just in case, just in case, uh, select a speaker. Okay, now I should be able to hear anybody who has a sudden moment of panic. Um, <laughs> I lost my train. So that phrase from Corbin about Tahuil, uh, which I will requote. <laughs> yeah. It is the mainspring of every spirituality in the measure to which it preeminently furnishes you the means of going beyond all conformisms, all servitudes to the letter, all ready-made opinions. So, so if, you're, if you're really against living by the letter of whatever law, if you're really against adopting ready-made opinions, if you're really a non-conformist, then Corbin's saying, you need to learn Tawheel. Well, to make a very long story very short, in the 1950s, when Corbin was first translated into English, there were a whole bunch of poets in the United States who were non-conformists and super interested in language as a means of personal transformation. And they read Henri Corbin and they loved this idea of Tahuil as a hermeneutic of the text and the soul simultaneously. And I'm going to presume that everyone has read this, and if you haven't, you've heard it talked about. But for Corbin, when, and let's just for a moment here, remember what, it's, what it was like 
for the monks at the time of Hugh of St. Victor in the 12th century, as we are, as it is revealed to us by Ivan Illich in his extraordinary book in the Vineyard of the Text, they would mumble because the, the manuscripts of the, of the holy book that they had at the time um, didn't look like they do today. There weren't, there weren't paragraphs, there weren't periods, there were just the letters, and often not the vowels, but the consonants. Um, and so they had to very, it, it was so, so reading was very difficult. It was physically difficult, as they reported. You could be exhausted after reading, you know, the Gospel of John, utterly exhausted. But what you were trying to do in your interpretation as a, as a monk was to change your soul, was to alter your, Corbin would say, mode of being. So the, the point of the reading was not entertainment, and it wasn't even understanding in any, in any modern sense. It was to absorb the meaning of the Word of God for you in that moment. So that's what interpretation and hermeneutics meant originally in the West. It was a passionate engagement with the Word of God, which was conceived to be infinitely meaningful and utterly inconceivable that it could be captured in the in the literal words on the page you had to read extremely actively and you could read wrong you know you could read right you could read wrong you, imagine imagine believing that your eternal soul is dependent upon your reading of these words. Not that you'll be damned if you get it wrong, but that it matters in that sense that Charles Taylor meant. It really matters, and the fact that it's mattering to you means that you're becoming a person, you know. Imagine thinking that and realizing, oh my God, there's so many potential meanings here. Oh, Oh wow. I mean and you don't you're not thinking it, you're feeling it. You're thinking with your heart. You are reading with your heart. It's that sense that Illich describes, which is exactly what Corbin means by hermeneutics. So hermeneutics is it's one of the most important acts of human being. And and it's not restricted to reading a book. It extends to being sensitive to the presences in the world around you, and, and, which is overwhelming, you know, and therefore you have to be careful. I think one of the reasons, uh, I'm not sure where this is said, but one of the reasons we ended up as, as, as cloistered <laughs> as we are inside our own little heads is because letting the world in is pretty outrageous. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff going on out there. And the more sensitive you become to it, the more extraordinary it becomes. And at a certain point, you have to say, oh, screw it. I'm going to go watch Netflix for a while because it's just too much, you know. So that is what Corbin is getting. And it's that in that sense of the 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 moral and p personal and religious and uh, um, uh fundamentally human importance of reading that came across to the poets in the 50s and 60s uh, charles olson among the very first but more contemporary is um george quasha who was a colleague of uh, 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 another poet, Robert Kelly. And George Quasha wrote, a, a, and I've done, I've covered this material in other courses, but he, he wrote a wonderful um, essay on 
I forget what it's called, but I can send it to you if you remember to ask me, in which he talks about the fundamental characteristics of Tahuil. And I think this is probably better than reading Corbin. Well, no, I can't say that. Um, but it's it's perfect. So the Tahuil that he's talking about is the kind of top wheel that every poet hopes her readers will engage in when reading her work. I mean, this is the kind of reader that any writer really wants. Somebody who takes that writing so seriously, so personally, and is transformed by it, right? I mean, who, does, who wouldn't love that? So Quasha says the following, and I think we even have time to do this. So here are some characteristics, and I have a list, and I could make it available, and I would send you the, yeah. So here you are, and, and if you want to think of the Quran or the Torah or the Bible or William Blake or Leslie Scalapino or pick your favorite poet. Whatever it is, this is a text that we're reading. And if you want to, you can apply it to the natural world. So first of all, you're sitting down in front of this poem, and the text is a continuous present. That is to say, <laughs> and here comes the Zoroastrian weirdness about time. Every time you read... There's a, there's a couple poems that always blow me away. Oh, one of them is Robert Duncan's um, uh, uh, um, uh, Opening of the Field. You know, uh, sometimes I have been, yeah, that one. But there are a couple of poems that always get me. So you have to think of one of those. If you don't have one, that's fine. But you should, have, you should find one because <laughs> it's magic. And maybe it's the first paragraph of the Gospel of John, you know. Every time you go there, you're in your own time. You're in, a, you're in the present. You're, and that poem is the continuous present. And each time, you engage it as if it were your own. That is mine. That is, it's personal. It's, this is the opposite of uh, literary criticism. Right? It's like, oh, oh, I'm, I'm back in that world. I'm back in this poem. It's mine. And then each reading is a first time. Uh, that works for me with that Duncan poem. Every time I read it, I don't have it with me right now. Every time I read it, it's like, oh my God, there we are again. Each reading is a first. That has theological implications, which I guess we don't have time to go into, but there's, a, but yes, we do, just I'll take, so uh, um, um, Olivier Clément, who is a, 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 a Russian Orthodox theologian in Paris in the 50s and 60s, uh, in a little book on uh, the, the, uh, the theological anthropology, says um, that paradise is, um, a series of first, a series of firsts, first love, first child, first, the first time, you, or in another tradition, it's beginner's mind. Each time, it's beginner's mind. Every time I read this poem, I'm, I'm just reading it like a beginner. And Next, the meaning is uncertain. Because if it were certain, well, what the hell? Why would you bother? You know, one plus one equals two. That, I can imagine, I can imagine. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, sure, I, yeah, I can imagine <laughs> mathematics as poetry. Um, and, but that will take us elsewhere. 
but the but essential is that the meaning is uncertain and here's the here's the you know word of god thing it's like <laughs> God said in the be, you know, let there be light or whatever God said in the beginning, you know, it's like, oh, well, that must have multiple meanings. <laughs> the meaning has to be uncertain. Otherwise, it, it's it's part of that general close offedness, that general death of reality, which occurs when you know something. It's it's why fundamentalism is always deadly. Yeah, because if you know the truth, then you got to pretty much kill everything because anything that's alive is not going to conform to it for any length of time at all for all the ontological and cosmological reasons we've been unpacking. So the meaning of this Tahwil uh, po poem has to be uncertain and perpetually virtual, like the angel out ahead, or the generative creativity of the living, animate cosmos. So it has to be unpredictable, uncertain, and then, I love this one for reasons that I'm not quite sure, no paraphrase is possible. Oh yes, I know exactly why I love it. No paraphrase is possible because the map is not the territory. And we're so used to hearing that. I really had that come home to me the other day, and now I can't remember exactly what the, what the context was. Oh, I know what it was, and I think I told the other class, but I didn't tell you. I was in the process of trying to think with my heart in the uh, virtual presence of my current therapist, and I suddenly caught myself out because I was having a feeling that I, which is, of course, if you're someone like me, that's like, oh, 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 I might be able to articulate this and differentiate it and know what the hell is going on with me. I noticed in that fraction of a second that my cognition was way out ahead of me and was already seeing the paths that I might take and the ideas that might come out of this and miraculously, I saw that seeing and I suddenly realized that what was happening was I was engaging in this continuous present where no paraphrase is possible. And then the cartographer, the cognitive cartographer comes flying in and says, Ooh, look what you've discovered. This is really exciting. I'm going to take it and put it on the map. And then I'm good. And then you won't have to worry at all about what comes next. I've got it. I've got it down. And I realized, holy shit, I do that all the time. I have one little tiny discovery and then the cognition takes over and I map the whole territory. And then you may as well go home because you got the map. You just put it in your pocket and said, well, I could have gone there, but I didn't. And the whole point of everything that we're talking about here is that, no, you really have to go there. The map is not going to do because it will always be flat and abstract and most of the time wrong. And although I get extremely excited about making maps, the reality is underneath them. And you, you know, <laughs> so that's why in reading this text, no paraphrase is possible, which sort of undercuts all of literary criticism. Um, not quite, but, but just not quite. But you see that you have to, if you're trying to teach a poem to someone, you really can't teach it to them. They have to discover it themselves. And anyone who's taught anyone anything ever will begin to realize that. Because there's a difference between them listening to you talk and the light that shines in one of their eyes when they finally see what it is you're pointing at. Right? It's like, oh, I had no idea. This is great. Now I finally see it myself. And then, of course, you want to go tell someone about it, so you bring your map. 
<laughs> and the whole trick is to is to, well, it's like you know, so the so the so the metaphor is that's what God did with the books, the Quran, the Torah, the New Testament. He said, "Look, here's a map, but what I want you to do is fucking read it." <laughs> <laughs> you know, and don't use it as a map, use it as a window or a door, but you got to do it. And fundamentalists everywhere will say, no, no, book's enough. That's it. <laughs> you see, you see this is, it seems to me that this is, this is the heart of it. This is just the heart of what Corbin is up to. And I think it's the heart of what Hillman is up to and Jung and, and, and every poet. And as Hillman is happy to say, every artist, I didn't go into that, but in his preface to his book on emotions, he says, well, he says, and this came as a bit of a surprise to me, he says, I do arts therapy. And I hadn't thought of him as an arts therapist, but he says, that's what I do. And he wrote it in 1991, and it was a book written in 62. And he says, no, I do arts therapy, by which he means imaginative therapy. Because the only way you can engage with these realities is to really engage with them at the, at the material top wheel level. No yeah. paraphrase is possible. Teachers are only good to lead you to a certain point, and then you have to jump, you know, well, and then you're I on your own. You Maybe they could, Leia? Can I ask something? Please. Um, Yes, I think when you paraphrase, because I think maybe because when you paraphrase, why you shouldn't paraphrase? Maybe because when you paraphrase, you actually change the, maybe the symbols or something. So the minute you change them, also what's behind the symbol, kind of, you know, the, 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 the when you change the exoteric, which is attached to the esoteric, then you are changing also the esoteric. So you actually have to read the text on your own with no paraphrasing and all this uh, critical literary critic, critic that, you know, explain everything and all that, it's all outside. It's like they are taking exoteric, they're changing into another exoteric, into another esoteric, into another exoteric, and never get into esoteric. And in order to get there, you know, that's the inside out and whatever in your book. In order to get there, you have to read it on your own. I mean, this is the, I think, the phenomenology of Corbin that you hold, you, you, don't, you don't do the Hegel thing, you don't sublate anything. You hold the exoteric and the esoteric together. They have to be together. You cannot change any of them, and it's your... Uh, esoteric, your your individual, you read it with your experience, what you see, it's your journey of the Avicenna, it's your recital, you have to do it with the text, but you can, but the minute you change the text, or you make explanation, or you, or, which is, comes from outside, you already change the esoteric, it will be something else, the esoteric, so you yeah. cannot do that, you have to do your own journey, kind of. Yeah. So yeah, maybe it's also something like that you think? I do, I do, and I think I. Th oh God, I mean, this happens every. Uh, uh, uh. So, so those issues always come up in translations, you know. And any good translator will say, "Well, the poem that I've got, that I got from my whoever." isn't the same poem it's a different poem and every you know and oh there's there's actually some really some really good material written about translation which raises all of these issues in, in another kind of context uh, one of the things that occurred to me when you're saying is you, you change one word and it changes the reality be 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 so one of the intuitions that I have, and you can go with it or not, is that given a text that you're reading this way, there's an uncountable number of possible, I don't even know, possible top wheels, <laughs> all right? And each step in that process will lead to another bifurcation, by many bifurcations. You change one word and 
I, you know, I think we really ought to read a book uh, by the, by by the physicists on the pluriverse because they're the only current they're the only people I, I I encounter these days. This is the quantum physicists who engage with this this maddeningly ridiculous idea of pluriverses. They're the only people I know who are engaged with this kind of analysis of of reality, where each step you take opens another infinity of possibilities which is different it's and i i really think that those dynamics are implicit in at least in in corbin's um, uh, angelic hierarchies whether he was aware of it or not i'm not sure but i'm sure i'm sure he had to be because he because the angelic hierarchies, if you literalize them, they're just ridiculous. You have to not literalize them. You have to tie wheel them. Yes, Erica. The, the question that I've been having, and this has been for a while, who are the guardians of the books? Oh, that's right? wonderful. Because okay. Go ahead. But that's, that's where I'm going, you know. I mean, of course, you know my point of view is that women are not present uh fem the feminine is present as an archetype but here and there but not really the mother is not the end going of all of this although it might be Birth. well for <sighs> we've been yeah we've done this, it's huge. A bunch of... this is, yeah, no this no is it's huge, huge. um yeah. and and so part of the immediate Part of the immediate context for that, with Corban and and Jung at least, is that they they intuited that uh, Jung was you know pretty or pretty patriarchal by by nature, and I don't know about Corban because I don't, um, uh, but they both recognized the the feminine was missing in all of Western religion, um, it and. And it's not it's it's not too much to say that although they they weren't feminist thinkers in the contemporary sense, that their that their whole their whole opus in each case was devoted to trying to bring the feminine into the fold of Western monotheism. And of, and they both well. Okay, here's the thing. I wish I I wish I knew more about Corban's biography, um, but I but here's a fantasy that I have. You know, he he was pinioned between his distaste for Catholic orthodoxy and um, the idea prior to Luther that in order to know what the Bible said, you had to go to church and have some guy read it to you. Mm -hmm. Luther translated the New Testament into German so that each individual could read it for him or herself without the mediation of the entirely male church hierarchy. And I think that's the interpretation of Luther that Corbin favors. And yet the Catholic Church was the one that went into community and society to change. So there's that. There right? is that. And there's the fact that the Protestants weren't any better at bringing women in until very recently than the, than the Catholics were. Um, but I, I mean, I totally agree with you. But but the uh, it's always it's always fraught to bring gender into this. But it seems to me that the Tahwil, as Corban understands it, and as Kelly and Quasha understand it, is very. Uh, I don't want to say it's feminist, um, but from a certain point of view, it is very feminist. Because it has the it it contains the themes which were missing in Western thought because it was patriarchal. 
the text is a continuous present rather than on the on the single line of time it's personal it's repetitive of a first it's uncertain you know uncertainty fluidity movement gestation birth you know those are all serious feminist themes and i think you find it in the tahwil as Corbin and Quasha and the other poets understood it. So I think that whether they were doing it uh, consciously or not, they were working hard, and sometimes they were doing it consciously, they were working very hard to bring in all that stuff that had been devalued for centuries. Yeah. But I'm sorry, but just, so the book, is a, is a paradox, paradox because, because the book, book freezes, freezes it. it. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. So, so the, 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 this is not strictly speaking true. It's bad history, but it's true enough for our purposes. So you write the Bible down or the Quran, both of which both of which were 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 transmitted orally, which is kind of safe because you know there's always a little uncertainty. You know, it's not eh, eh. then you write it down. Plato knew that was going to lead to trouble. And and you write it down and then you've got the word. And here it is. And then you have it in a form, and of course it's a long history, but then you have it in a form that you can say, no, no, look at what God said. And then you have the possibility of fundamentalism. No, no, no. Then you have the possibility. I mean, it's a stupid idea, <laughs> but it's one that immediately occurs. Say, so once you write it down, it has a best meaning. And what Corbin's whole theology is about is to say, well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> How could that possibly be true? Uh, S.H. Nasser somewhere in comment, commenting on the Quran says, and I've said this a million times and it's in one of the books, but it blew me away. He says, you know, people think that the Quran, like it, you know, it says something and you're supposed to stick to it. He says, no, no, no. He says, the Quran is what you get when, when God tries to, put divine meanings into a the the fragile crumbling vessel of human language and and what you get is this jumble of weird stuff and of course it doesn't make any sense the struggle is to make sense of it you know it's like but the fundamentalist position is well God wouldn't have said something that was wrong. He would have said something that was right, and he'd want it to be clear and distinct. He was a Cartesian, after all, you know? And so we should say, look, read what he said and believe it. And, and historically, that kind of literalist reading of the Bible kind of happened at the same time that science was taking off and trying to be literal. Theologians knew for centuries that there were many levels of meaning in these holy books. You needed interpretation, and you needed to explicitly acknowledge that there were five, six, seven levels of meaning. I mean, I think Muhammad says there are seven kinds of meaning, and then there's the meanings that only I know, and then there's the meaning that only God knows, and it just goes on forever. And Corbin is trying to say that that that's what perpetual hermeneutics is all about and 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 that is anything but controlling and patriarchal so you could read you could read corban's fear of fundamentalism as a, a feminist move you know uh ooh i know we're out of time and i'm almost out of energy but let me let me read the rest of these to you. There's only a few. And then um, I will, if I don't remember to do it tonight, remind me, I'll send you the list and I'll send you his, send you his essay. Because this, this is great stuff. Reading is the operation 
That is, it is the alchemical operation. Reading is the alchemical operation. It, it cannot map onto any procedure, which means it, there's no algorithm. The story cannot be known in advance. The message of the top wheel is the state of receptivity necessary to accomplish it. You see, because it's always virtual. So the message of the angel out ahead is the receptivity necessary to intuit her. Yeah. The top wheel builds an altar and not a temple. Temple's too closed. An altar is open to everything. Uh, the process, he says, is proprioceptive. He gets this from his own experiences, but historically, uh, Charles Olson was the person in the 20th century in, the, in, in North America who was a poet who stressed the proprioceptive, that is the embodied material aspect of reading and cognizing and living from out of the poem. Okay, so, so that's super important if you're someone like me who thinks of reading as a cognitive intellectual experience, and they're, they're pointing to the fact that when you think that's what's happening, that's not what's happening because you can't get rid of your body. And if you're feeling abstracted, that itself is a bodily phenomenon, right? It re this reading requires an open identity. And then he says, we all are fundamentalists of our own ideas. And because of that, this process can save us from ourselves. Because what are you reading from? I'm reading from something that I put together out of George Quash's essay, which I will send you. So he's got this whole essay, and I kind of abstracted what I thought were the key points. The fact that the whole thing is mysterious and unpredictable and unanticipatable and unmappable and unparaphrasable, to be get comfortable with that, it teaches you emptiness in a, in, a, in a Buddhist sense. And then he says, at the end of the essay, I think, he says, when this works as it's supposed to, and, I, and if Corbin had said this, it wouldn't be out of place in any of his work, works, he says, when you, when you do this kind of reading, all of our secret personal fundamentalisms dissolve into breath. Oh, <laughs> isn't that sweet? <laughs> that is so great. <laughs> uh, George Quasha, Q-U-A-S-H-A. -A. He's a he's a genius. Uh, he's a poet and an artist um, and a publisher, and he's as good as they get. Um, so I recommend him to you. Uh, and obviously, he and Robert Kelly and uh, Stein and a bunch of others uh, were, were alive and, and, and receptive to Corbin in the 50s. Um, and they took it and ran with it and made their own, their, their own <laughs> poetry out of that. And it happens that these are all guys, um, but it is not true. That there were the that it was only guys who were reading Corbin. Um, it happens that they were the I I know of no women who wrote about Corbin and Tahuil, um, though I know of women who who were poets because I did that work um, who who were who were moved by him, including uh, uh, um, um, uh, both their names always escape me. Um, Mm, which is, you know, which tells you something. Um, but it was these, it was, you know, and here's, here's the footnote to the footnote. I, I think it's the guys 
who were so gobsmacked by this that they wrote about it. And I like to think that the women poets, they thought, yeah, that's right, that's right. And now I'll just go on doing what I've been doing. But that the guys were so struck by it because they didn't quite have it. And now they could get it. I mean, that's very gender and it's very bad of me. Um, but I, I, there may be something to it. Oh, what's her name, uh, uh, Erica, who also was uh, the, 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 um, yeah, the, the Mexican-American woman. What's her name? Uh, she was really, uh, uh, yeah, there's, there's a, in, the, in another course, we'll dig all the women out and put them on the table. <laughs> all right, I, I've got to leave. Um, and thank you for sticking with this and and I'll put something up soon tonight to read for next time and um, and I will put Quash's thing in a link so you can look at it thanks and I will see you all uh, <laughs> next week thank bye you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Bye.